Thank you. Hello. So when I think back to the 1990s, and I think about how it's significant, the internet has significantly changed our lives since then. So it's really changed how we buy music and books, and it's changed how we listen to music, and it's changed how the big companies can customise promotions and advertising at us. But it's mainly it's changed how we connect to our friends and family. So if you think about it, if you've got family in a different country, and you, you can Skype them and just talk to them as though they're in exactly the same room as you. Or you can connect to your friends on Facebook 24 hours a day and tell them what you're up to, if you so wish. Um, so that's all been pretty huge. But what I want to talk about today, I think, will have an even bigger impact on society going forwards. So there's something similar going on all around you, and you may not even be aware of it, but it's there. And what I really want to talk about first is what's driving and enabling that. And that's big data, more specifically, industrial big data. So what do I mean when I say big data? Well, I think most people understand that term in the context of something like Twitter users will send over 100,000 tweets every minute, or Google will get 2 million queries a minute. But really, industrial big data is set to really swamp that. So as a point of comparison, um, maximum Twitter usage in 2013 was about 500 million tweets a day. And that equates to 130 gigabytes of data a day. So, in comparison, one of your big power-generating gas turbines equipped with 200 sensors monitoring it will create more of the order of 600 gigabytes of data a day. And that's only going to scale up. So, to talk about um, how we expect that to scale up over time, let's go to a domain that I actually know more about. And from the picture, it's obvious that we're talking about um, aircraft engines. And that's an aircraft engine on a, on a test stand, and it's undergoing weather-proof weather testing. So what interests me more than the picture, really, though, is the bar chart. So in the 1970s and 1980s, your typical engine that was sat on those test stands um, was generating of the order of about 20 to 30 parameters. And we would get those back maybe one or two snapshots per flight. Now, when you think about the engines that were sat on those test stands in the early 2000s, we've had a huge step change. So we're getting more of 1,000 parameters coming off of those. And as opposed to just getting one or two snapshots of flight, we're now getting up to 10 points a second on all of those parameters. And now the engines that are in design now and are going to go on those test stands pretty soon, we're thinking double that. And that really, that picture's mirrored across industries. So um, your trains will send you 9 million data points an hour, or something like one of your energy smart meters will give you 35 gigabytes of data a day. So we've got big data, but so what? Why should society even care about that? Well, the data by itself is pretty meaningless, but and the International Data Corporation estimates that we are putting maybe 3% of that data in a position where it can actually be usefully looked at and used. But even less, just a half a percent of the world's data that we're generating at the moment is actually actively being analysed. So that really represents a huge opportunity for society. So think about if we could actually use all of that data properly and leverage it to help us solve some of our society's big challenges going forwards. So think about things like the energy problem. So we're consuming more and more energy, and our traditional sources of energy are either running out or doing huge damage to the environment. But think about if we could truly use all the huge amounts of data that's coming off something like wind turbines to maximise the power output and the efficiency of those. Think about how, if we could do that across the renewable energy sources, how that could actually make those a viable part of the solution going forwards. Or we all love our foreign holidays, right? And air travel has become a way of life. But unfortunately, it does that damage to the environment as well. So think about it, if we could actually use all that data that's coming off the aircraft, all that's coming off of the engines, to actually be able to drive forward some massive improvements in fuel efficiency and fuel performance. And then we could continue with our way of life, more or less, and without doing such damage to the environment. And there's other examples across industries. Um, so our roads are becoming more and more congested. What about using all that data that came off the trains to actually optimise um, the uptime and the performance of uh, things like trains in order to drive a, a change in the public behaviour? Um, or something like uh, healthcare. So all the data that's coming off of uh, the big healthcare machines and all the data that's in the public health system, if we can use that to optimise patient flow, and minimise the extent to which the healthcare service is creaking at the moment. So earlier I spoke about um, the internet and how it was really changing our lives. Um, and I said that there was something similar happening all around us. 
Um, you may not even be aware that it's happening, and it's being driven by big data. Well, what I was really talking about was something very similar happening in the industrial world. So by the year 2020, we expect there to be about 50 billion machines connected to the internet. And by that, I'm not talking about your cell phones, and I'm not talking about your PCs. What I'm talking about is things like trains and wind turbines, things like aircraft and engines, and the big power-generating gas turbines. So everything is going to be connected up, measured, and managed that way. And that starts to open up those huge opportunities I was talking about earlier. So we can actually use that data to solve some of society's problems. So what will happen is when your engineer can access data from anywhere and at any time, um, or when machines can actually look at their own data and learn from it in real time, or learn from other machines similar to them in real time, well then your monitoring and diagnostics really starts to become proactive as opposed to reactive. So I've spoken about um, big data and I've spoken about the industrial internet, but how do we truly leverage those to get the benefits to society that I was talking about earlier? Well, the missing piece in the puzzle is really analytics. So today, with our advanced analytics, in combination with the big data, we're starting, just starting, to be able to see things that we couldn't see before. So it allows us to sort the wheat from the chaff in a way. We can see what's anomalous operation in the data. We can see what normal operation looks like and we can find insights and patterns in the data. And when you use that to create analytics, then you start to be able to predict the future. You can predict when things are going to break. You can predict when, which ways to operate your machinery in order to get the best efficiency for you. And then, when you combine that with the industrial internet, and you put those analytics right at the heart of that, and you have those automated and running real time, so then they can continuously evolve and update themselves, and continuously update the way that they're actually um, driving the machines that they're operating on. Well, that's when you really start to gain the efficiencies and the uptime um, and the better performance out of your assets. And that's how we start to get the benefits to society that I was talking about earlier. But really, to create great analytics very, very quickly in the industrial domain, you need something else. So as a data scientist, it's really my job to create analytics that help us to start to be able to predict failures of parts inside those aircraft engines. And as part of that, I do have an understanding of how aircraft engines work. However, these are really compl complex and specialised and safety-critical machines. And as such, an engineer can spend their entire career just working and learning about one small piece of that engine. So as data scientists who work across far broader fields, we can't hope or expect to have that knowledge about everything we work on. And I've actually lost count of the number of times that I'll be looking at data and I think, why is it doing that? Is that some strange mode of operation? Or is that genuinely a sign of the fault that I'm actually looking for in the data? And that's where our domain experts, having those on hand to actually help us to work out um, what's a spurious line of inquiry, that actually me means your data scientists become more efficient as well. So what happens when we actually put all of that together and um, we start to, um, everything that I've spoken about earlier actually comes together and everything works right as, as it should do? Well, one example of an early adoption of the industrial internet is really in the GE Renewables business. So there we've got, um, we're looking at wind turbines and we're not looking at it as just individual wind turbines on their own. We're looking at it as huge fleets of wind turbines across wind turbine farms and looking at it as intelligent systems. So there you've got your software and your analytics and they've really become the enabler um, to be able to sit on those turbines and then actually the data and they're all connected up and they, those turbines are actually looking at each other's data and enabling them to actually learn from each other. So what happens then is one individual wind turbine might lose its speed and direction but it can actually look at the data from its neighbours and it can work out exactly how it should start operating in order to get its maps, maximum power output. And then when you can do that across wind farms, then you can get your availability, maximum availability and your maximum power output possible. And then you can um, start to imagine how we can start to get loads more power out of our assets. So when you think about it, think about if we can do that across all of industry, and we can really start to use that 99.5% of data that the IDC estimates is not currently being analysed at all. And think about how 
that can actually start to bring about some of those benefits for society that I was talking about earlier and solve some of those challenge, challenges for us. And when I think about the scope for doing that, that's why I'm really enthusiastic about the future of big data and I'm really enthusiastic about the future of where the industrial internet is going. Thank you very much. <laughs>